Uh, sorry, wrong Raiders. Let's try this again. I've had three copies of this game since the mid to late 1980s, but I was never able to properly play it until maybe a few months ago. Hi everyone, it's Steve, and today we'll talk about Star Raiders and build the special controller that's required to play this game, as well as several other games on the Atari 2600. Okay, so as it says right here on the label, use with the joystick controller and video touchpad. That's what we're going to build today, a video touchpad. So why don't I have one of these already? Well, oddly enough, I don't ever remember my friends having a video touchpad either. And we all had several copies of this game. We kind of just dismissed it as the game that it just didn't work because we couldn't figure out what a video touchpad was. I think it had something to do with our parents and how they purchased these games for us. And most of these games were sold at the time in garage sales or you know, yard sales, and our parents would just pick them up in bulk and just kind of dismiss the fact that they needed the controller. Well, thanks to the internet, now we can build one on our own. Star Raiders is the only game Atari released for use with the video touchpad, but they also created two other similar controllers for use with other games. The video touchpad, the keyboard controller, and the kids controller all come in different sizes, but have the same 12 button configuration. As we'll soon see, all of these controllers are functionally identical and may be used interchangeably. However, any game that uses these controllers will typically interpret a button pressed differently. For instance, one button might mean move up for one game or shields down in another game. To help the player not have to memorize and remember all these permutations, each game was distributed with an overlay card that may be attached and removed from the face of the controller. All right, so here's the schematic of the board we're going to build. And it looks pretty complicated, but I'm going to add some color to it and that will help clear some things up. So I've gone ahead and I've borrowed some of my daughter's markers to do this and she's going to get upset when she finds out that I did this without her permission. She's pretty particular about these things and something about them always being dried up when she wants to use them. but. This is being done in the name of education, so I'm taking the fall for all of you guys and girls that are watching this. And one thing you might notice while I'm coloring this is that there are 12 buttons and only 7 pins being used on the input. If you remember how the traditional Atari 2600 joystick works, or any compatible joystick for that matter, is that you have one input pin for every button and a common ground. So there would be, what, five or six different pins being used on the original controller for five or six, five different inputs for that matter. So what is being done here? Why is it that we have this disparity and how is it that the Atari is able to distinguish between certain button presses when there aren't enough pins for button inputs? The first thing to notice is that the same side of each button in a row is connected together, denoted by the yellow color, and that carries on to distinct pins, denoted by the red color, and similarly the opposite side of each button in a column is also connected together and also going to the same pins. And when components are organized in such a row and column manner, we typically call that in mathematics a matrix, and that's why this type of circuit is typically called a keyboard or a button matrix. And the way that the Atari 2600 and other systems deal with such a keyboard matrix circuit is that they scan each of the rows very quickly looking for an input on the corresponding column pin. Here's a quick example. Let's say that at a particular moment in time, the Atari is scanning row one. So it'll place a voltage on row one from this pin. And if there's a corresponding voltage on pin six, then we know that button three was pressed because the voltage will carry through this connection, through the button, and all the way down into pin six. Similarly, if a voltage on pin five is detected while row one is still being held high, then we know that pin or button one was pressed in this case. So when that scanning is done, it will move to the next row 
in this case from pin 2, and it will apply the same algorithm, looking for a press of buttons 4, 5, or 6. So what happens if you press button 8 and it's scanning rows 1 or row 2? Well, nothing would register because there's no voltage coming across this side of the button. However, this scanning happens so quickly that it's much faster than a human's reaction time. It's almost guaranteed that the scan will have happened already, and the person that pressed button 8 would be no wiser to that fact. And that's really all there is to it. It's just a matter of the hardware scanning each row very quickly and checking for an input on the corresponding column, and using some logic to decode that information. But there's one last piece of this puzzle that I can't quite figure out. What does this do? I'm going to mark it in green, because that will be important later. I haven't quite figured out what that component is for. As you can tell, we are bridging pins 9 and 5 via a potential voltage divider or a resistor network to pin 7. And I tried to guess what this was used for, and I can't quite figure it out. I thought maybe it's for you know, pushing two or more buttons in combination or something to that effect, but they're all the comp things that I can think of can easily be, excuse me, for can easily be accomplished by the typical scanning that happens on the rows in the keyboard matrix. So if you know the purpose of this setup with these resistors on pin 7, uh, please leave a comment below. Uh, maybe there's a game that uses it in a certain configuration. Uh, I'd really be interested in knowing that just for the sake of completeness. All right, let's have a quick look at all the components we'll need to build the controller. Move this aside for a moment. Uh, first things first, we've got a circuit board, double-sided. It's kind of preferable since I can solder components to both sides. Uh, I have some hookup wire, which colors conveniently match the colors I drew on this schematic. Uh, that will help me identify where the wires are going. And we have a typical project box. Put that over here. I have some of these momentary push button switches. They are 15 millimeters in height. I have a whole bag of them, so we'll need about 12. And then I have some of these screw down terminals. These will help for connecting the cable from the controller wire into the circuit board. And of course we have a cable for the controller itself. Uh, this is an extension cable. It has both the male and female ends. Uh, we're only interested in the, sorry, the male end, so we'll just cut the female one off when we build it. And finally, I have a cable gland for the box. This is, I believe, a PG5 or PG7. I'll confirm that uh, in a moment. And this will basically secure the cable to the box and provide some strain relief. And let's not forget two 4.7K resistors for the mystery section down here on the circuit board. All right, well, let's get the soldering iron heated up and let's start putting all this stuff together. I'm going to start by installing all these push button switches onto the board, but before I do that, I want to note that it's important to pay attention to the direction in which you install these switches. Most of these switches have pairs of leads that are connected to one another. So in this case, the pairs that are shown with the line etched into the switch are the ones that are connected. So in this case, it's these opposite ends on this side and corresponding opposite ends on the other side. When the switch is closed, then the perpendicular ends complete the circuit, these two and these two. You can also tell by looking on the side of the switch, the pairs that are connected are going to be the ones that are installed on opposite ends of the side of the switch. So there are no leads connected to this face but there are pairs of leads connected to this face. In this case, these pairs are the ones that will be closed or connected when the switch is pressed. So because we're going to be installing switches in rows and in columns, and in each of those rows, we're going to have one end of the switch connected to the other, and similarly, one end of the opposite side of the switch connected to the other in the columns, we need to be extremely careful and make sure that we install these switches in the correct orientation. Otherwise, there'll be all sorts of problems when you start pushing buttons and using the controller. So I have one switch installed and I'm going to follow the same orientation of that switch when installing the remaining switches for this board.
Okay, so I just finished reviewing all the solder joints and some of them needed to be reflowed. I wasn't quite happy with them, but now they all look pretty good. There's this one little goof up over here, which I could probably just leave it as is. I don't think I'll be using that hole and it won't cause any problems. Uh, more I could just wick it out later on if I really want it to be meticulous. So the next step is to start installing the screw down terminals and I have to install them on an angle because when I originally bought this batch I bought the wrong pitch. These are 3.5 millimeter pitch and the circuit board is 2.5 millimeters so they will not install straight across. That's okay, I installing them on an angle is just fine, there's enough space in here to do so. Okay, that was a little trickier than expected because these things don't like to stay put. A um, couple of bad spots over here. I'll reflow some of these if I don't like them, but and I'll also clean up some of the holes I put some extra solder in. Okay, so as I was cleaning up some of those joints, I noticed a small problem. And if we look closely on the terminal on the corner, you'll notice that there, this one here is not entirely flush with the circuit board. There is a bit of a gap underneath the bottom of the component. So what I'm going to do is I will press down on this component really hard with my finger while I heat up the two uh, joints that hold it in place. And then once those joints melt, I should be able to snap it in to the board a little bit closer and then it'll, the joints will cool down and everything should resolve itself. So let me try and do that right now. It's a little bit better. It's not perfect. Let me uh, try it again. Yeah, that's much better. Uh, that gap is pretty much gone. Before we continue, I want to point out a small problem with the project box that we're going to be using. As you can tell, there's a standoff in this box in each of the corners, but the standoffs are too far apart to actually mount the circuit board that I'm using. Here's an unmodified circuit board of the same dimensions for the one that we're using, and as you can tell, it just flops right in there, not making any contact with the standoffs. So to solve this problem, I'll just cut these tiny little pieces of ABS plastic. They're about one square centimeter in dimensions and I used a scrap sheet that I had lying around. Uh, I'm going to stack these piles of three and these will be my standoffs. I'm going to glue them together and then position them where I need them and then glue them to the actual box. So I'll glue these together now and then leave them to dry while I resume work on soldering the rest of the components. Okay, the next thing I want to do is start to connect these switches together. And if you remember from the schematic diagram, rows of switches are connected together on one side of the switch, whereas columns of switches are connected together on the opposite side of the switch. I use a yellow color to denote the connections across each of the rows, and I'm going to use a yellow wire to make those connections. Now I should note that this type of circuit board is called a protoboard, uh, short for prototyping board, and it's totally okay to use a blob of solder to make a trace between the components you want to connect. I think that's fine for quick and dirty work, but I want this component or this circuit board to look nice and to last a long time. So I'm gonna go and take the extra time to connect the with wire and make it look a little pretty. You can use whatever technique is suitable for you. If you're gonna make uh, connections with solder blobs, that's fine, just make sure that there's no chance of short circuits in your implementation.
Okay, well, as uh, luck would have it, I had a little bit of a problem with this very last joint I was trying to complete. It seemed that it just did not want to bridge over and make a connection between these two pads. Uh, so I kept adding more solder to it quite foolishly and it wasn't working. And what ended up happening was I ended up bridging the wrong two joints. I ended up bridging this one and this one instead of this one and this one. And all that excess solder had flowed through to the other side and made a bit of a mess uh, near the switch. So as I had to clean all that up, I ended up melting part of the switch and I had to replace this uh, this wire uh, because all the insulation had melted off to, to all the heat. But I've cleaned up the joint. I've cleaned up the, uh, all the burnt flux that was in this area. Everything looks pretty tidy now. Um, and I've spot checked all the other joints and they all look pretty good. So off to the next step. Okay, next I'll connect each row of these push buttons to one of the pins of the screw down terminal. And if you remember from the schematic, I used a red color to denote that. So I'll use a red wire on each side of the board to implement that connection. All right, now is a good time to check that we have continuity between the screw down terminal and all the buttons in a particular row. And to do that, I'll keep things simple. I'll probe from the screw down terminal to the last button in the row. And if I get continuity, then I know that each of the buttons between those two joints are all hooked up. So I have my multimeter handy. Continuity is ready to test. I'll start, let's try this one. Okay, so that pin is good. Let's test the one above it. That one's good. And the other two here. That's good. And the one above it. And that one's good. And just for a sanity check, let's make sure we haven't shorted out any of these pins. Here to here. Here to here. That's good. And the other two. All right, that's good. Columns of push buttons are connected via a purple wire as shown on the schematic. And there isn't much room to do that on this side. So we'll use the back of this circuit board to implement those connections.
Okay, now's a good time to explain what I've done here. I've connected the same side pin from a push button along diagonals. So this is the bottom pin of the first row. It's connected to the bottom pin of the second row. And similarly, the bottom pin of the second row is connected to the bottom pin of the third row, etc. All the way through to the opposite side of the board, which I've connected it down to the uh, screw down terminal pin. So this has the same effect as connecting all the push buttons in a column on the same side, because as you remember, the bottom part of each push button is internally connected together. So what I'll do next is I'll just repeat this process for the remaining two columns and we'll be done. Well, that was a little trickier than expected. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and clean up the joints, trim off any excess wire, and then we'll do a continuity test to make sure everything is okay. All right, I'll use the same technique I did last time to test these connections. I'm going to probe the last button in the sequence and the screw down terminal connection. And if it beeps, we should be in good shape. All right, that one's good. Let's try the next row, or the next column rather. That one's good. And the last one. There we go. Okay. And I noticed on the back of the board that there are some places where my insulation went over top of an existing joint. Uh, and I want to make sure that that insulation did not melt when I did my soldering. So I'm going to probe these connections as well and check for shorts that are unexpected. So this one looks a little dodgy. This one here. And that one there. And that one's okay. That one works as expected. And that one is not connected as expected. All right. This one and that one. That one's fine. And finally, let's try this one over here. That one looks good too. Perfect. Okay, the last thing I need to do is to put those two resistors into the board and connect them to the last pin of the screw down terminal. So up until now, I haven't been paying any attention as to which of these wires are assigned to which pin on the actual joystick cable, because it really isn't necessary. Once we start hooking up the joystick cable, we can assign any pin we want to any of these screw down terminals. However, we will have to pay attention to that assignment when we go to hook up the resistors. As you recall from the schematic, the resistors specifically attach columns one and columns two together, and then the intersection of those resistors goes to the output pin. So column one is the column that has uh, numbers one, numbers four, number seven, and I think the asterisk. That means we have to orient this board in the way that we are actually going to install it into the case and then assign our rows and columns accordingly and then put the resistors in place. So I've oriented my board in a way that this part up here where all the screw down terminals are will be the top or the front of the box. And so this push button will therefore be assigned to number one, this one to number two, and this one to number three and the rest of the symbols and numbers accordingly. So I'll need to hook up my resistors so that they bridge these two columns and then ultimately connect to the last pin. Okay, I think we're done. One final cleanup of the board and a last test of this new pin, and then we can move on to assembling the case. All right, let's review the schematic one last time. We will see that when we measure the resistance between the pin for column one and the new pin we just connected, we'll be going through exactly one of those two 4.7K resistors and the multimeter set to resistance mode. So we should be detecting precisely that. 
when I measure this. And that's pretty close. Um, let's go to the next one. The pin for column two will also be measured through the same new pin that I connected, and that should also go through one resistor, providing a value of exactly 4.7K. And that's also pretty close. Now, if we measure the resistance between the pin for column one and column two, it should go through both of the resistors. Let's take a look at what that is. And that's about 9.4K, which is exactly two times 4.7K. This all looks pretty good. I'm happy with this board. Uh, let's go and start building the case for it. All right, so now I need to figure out where I'm going to drill 12 holes into my project box so that I could take my circuit board and mount it on the inside. Now, instead of figuring out the exact position of all these 12 holes in relation to the circuit board, I'm going to do a little shortcut and I'm going to take a, an imprint of it with some ink and then transfer that print onto this piece of paper and then build a template from that. This is just pigment ink that people use, I guess, for, you know, stamping and transferring patterns from um, a negative to a piece of paper. Um, and it should work quite well. I've tested it already in another piece of paper and the ink wipes off very cleanly from the top of these buttons. So let's see if I can create another imprint onto this paper and then build a template from that. Okay, so now what I need to do is to figure out uh, the dimensions of the circuit board with respect to where I've transferred the imprint of the tops of the buttons. And to do that, I'm going to have, I'll use my calipers to make some small measurements. Uh, I know that each of these push buttons is six millimeters in uh, length. So to get the distance from the edge of the circuit board to the uh, push button, I'll just subtract three millimeters and that will give me the distance to the center of the dot that I've transferred onto the paper. So this is about 13 millimeters um, and it's probably going to be the same on the other side. Oop, there we go. Yeah, about 13 millimeters. So I need to do 10 millimeters from each of these dots on each side will give me the boundary of one side of the circuit board. So do 10 millimeters. And then the other dimension will be approximately 11 millimeters minus three. Yeah, let's say that's 11, 11.3. I'll round it down to 11. Take away three, we get eight. So that will be eight millimeters on that end. And then the long end is about 19. So 19 minus three, measure that again. Yep, 19 minus three, 16 millimeters on this end. Now I'll construct a rectangle that's spaced uh, these distances from each of these respective sides of the ink transfer, and that will be my template for drilling holes into my project box. I've cut out my template and I've taped it to the inside of my project box. 
in a position where I think it's going to work out fairly well. Uh, it's sort of centralized and it's also positioned in a way that it's not going to interfere with those standoffs that I built earlier on. The standoffs are going to get glued in here later on and I just kind of dry fit them to make sure that they won't interfere with the buttons and where I think they're going to be once the circuit board is mounted in there. Finally, I'm going to have to put a cable in here so I've marked the position on the other side of the project box where I'm going to drill the large hole and place the um, cable gland to secure the cable that will ultimately connect this to the Atari 2600. We're going to drill two different size holes in this project box, the largest being the one that will allow the cable to pass through. And for that hole, I have a stepper bit that I'm going to use. And the smallest uh, size hole this will drill is one quarter inch, which is not small enough for the holes that I need to drill in the box for the push buttons. So for that, I'll use the typical technique of starting with a small drill bit and working my way up to an appropriate size. The hole that's going to go in the side of the box is one half inch and the holes that will go into the top of the box will be at most one eighth of an inch. Now I have a suspicion I'm going to need to use slightly larger drill bits than one eighth of an inch mainly because I'm going to freehand this and I might not get my drill bit exactly on the spot and because this is dependent on having a strict alignment of where the buttons line up uh, in relation to the circuit board I might have to enlarge those holes a little bit just so all the buttons will pass through. All right, here's the final product. And I had to enlarge these holes much larger than I anticipated, all the way up to 3 16ths of an inch or 11 64 somewhere in that area. What I noticed is that when I was placing the circuit board in here, first of all, it wasn't aligning properly, so I had to enlarge the holes. And when the circuit board finally did fit through and all the buttons came to the other side, I could press most of these buttons down. They were all engaging without them being stuck up against the side of the hole I drilled, but this one in the corner here was giving me trouble. If you know of a better technique on how to install one of these uh, button matrix circuit boards into a project box like this, uh, please let me know. I'd be very interested in knowing that technique uh, for future projects. My board's now ready to be attached to the inside of the box, and as you can tell, I've already got my standoffs in place. I was able to glue those in there earlier on, and I also drilled the necessary holes into the standoffs to allow the board to be attached. So that takes care of the case. I also went ahead onto the board and wrote down some numbers on the screw down terminals, and these numbers represent the pins that correspond to the wire that will ultimately attach to each of those terminals. The way I did this was pretty straightforward. Of course, I had to refer to the schematic diagram like so. And as you recall, I've denoted this button to be uh, number one. So this is row one and this is column one when it will be actually placed into the project box. So row one, we follow the red wire that goes into here and this corresponds to that terminal. And as the schematic shows, that will be pin one. And similarly, if we follow row two, the red wire that goes into that pin corresponds to this part of the terminal and that is position two and i repeated that for all the other wires that are on the board that lead into one of these terminals let's take a look at the cable now because that's also be ready to be attached into this board 
I've gone ahead and cut the male end off of this extension cable. Made sure it was the right end, otherwise we'd have a really short cable to deal with. But uh, the internal wires are pretty small and I've carefully stripped the insulation off of every single one of them. And now I've had to go through the painful process of probing every single one of these wires to the pins on the other end of the cable to figure out which ones are mapped to which pins. And I produced a little cheat sheet which I have taped to the inside of the lid of the project box. All right, let's get this cable hooked up. I've already threaded the cable gland through the cable and the cable through the hole. Now it's just a matter of putting these colored wires into their appropriate terminals. Now these wires are really thin and so what I find works best when dealing with thin wires and your typical sized uh, screw down terminals is that you can fold the wire in half like so just to kind of make it thicker and you kind of bunch that up and that allows for a better contact when inserting it into the screw down terminal. So I thought I'd do a quick demo of how Star Raiders works with this controller and part of my crappy setup here I don't have a video capture card so I'm going to try to get all of this in frame and make the best of it. So Star Raiders is in, the upscaler is hooked up and away we go. All right. Okay so the first button uh, is to show this view that's not going to do anything. The second button shows the galactic map and I can move around where I want to go with uh, my controller on this side. And then I think the third button is to warp, so let's warp to the star base. Okay. This isn't going to do anything because it tells me that my repairs are complete and I had nothing to repair. So let's go warp back to where the bad guys are and then switch over to the main view. That's the first button. Red alert! Shields up! Whoa! Okay, so I have to put my shields on, which I think is this button? Nope. That's this button. When the screen goes blue, there we go. Okay, so now I can crash into things. Energy is displayed over here. I'm getting hit. I better start shooting stuff. Okay. So that last button I pushed is the targeting system, which is really just an indicator of where your photon torpedoes are going to go. And anyway, you keep this up until you run out of energy or you destroy all the targets. There's seven remaining, so now I have to go and get some more energy because I took too many hits. So let's, whoops, warp over here. 
energy will restore itself, and the game continues until either you blow up or the bad guys destroy the starbase. So this looks to be working quite well. Uh, there's one more game I want to test this on, and that is... That's uh, Alpha Beam with Ernie. Now, let's see if the camera can pick this up. And you'll notice it says uh, you need the kids controller. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I don't have a kids controller, but we have a universal Atari kids controller, keyboard controller, video touchpad. So let's see how this thing works. Okay, so this is a two player game and I don't want to swap these things around. So I'll put this in two player mode. Okay, there it is. And here we go. So this is quite simple. It's just these four buttons, up, down, left, right. Think up shoots a laser upwards. Yeah, and down shoots the laser downwards. And you can figure out what you need to do here. You basically need to put the letters where they belong. And I think this is the extent of the, the difficulty. Maybe there are some more challenging levels that have numbers or something like that. But anyway, this is for children. It features Ernie from Sesame Street when you fill the ship up. And unfortunately, I won't be able to show that because I'm getting lazy. I don't want to swap the controllers around. But that's that. All right, well, I'm pretty happy with the way this controller turned out, and that will conclude this video. So, as usual, I hope you found this information useful, and thank you for watching.